please welcome truly the legendary Jim Keltner. There you are. Okay, this meeting is recorded. And All right. Beautiful. Got it again. Got it again. All right, Jim. I knew he would. Oh, man. It's so good to see you. Thank you so much. You look fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you do. You do. You always do. The, the coolest well, cat. Not bad for uh, 85, right? <laughs> I know you're not 80. I know you're not 85. Nice it's try, buddy. Well, it's coming for all of us. Um, yeah, <clears throat> no, that's true. So I see drums behind you. Where are you in your drum room? I'm in my drum room. Yeah, this is the downstairs. Yeah. Yeah. I've got, um, I've got another room, Jim, with about 10 drum sets set up of all vintage. Um, these are two. <laughs> Seriously? Seriously, yeah. Yeah. Man, like sorry, what were we gonna say? <laughs> like a playhouse or something, like a I mean, what do you ten drum sets? What well what kind of room is that? Is that a barn or something or a No, no, we, we, we have a house that has a, a like a finished basement. And basically uh, my, when we moved in here a couple of years ago, my wife said you can take the downstairs, put all your drums down there and, and just stay out of my way is what I think is exactly what she said. That's what they do. <laughs> I know that one. Yeah. Well, man, before I forget, I have to tell you that our dear friend Dave Maddox um, sends you his love. He was hoping to be part of this, you know, watch this today, but he's doing a session. But he he said to me twice in a text, please give my love to Jim. So oh, good. Good. I love my David. He's he's uh one of the baddest cats around. Yeah, absolutely. And man too. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Um, well, all right. I'm going to jump in here, Jim. Is this okay? Or should I, should I go more like that? Or that's the I only think, thing I know about. I think that's great. Yeah. You're, you're right centered in the, in the shot. So Yeah. What does okay. everybody else think? I, I think I think everybody thinks that you look great. Who's what, who's everybody? Eddie Taduri is watching. Uh, Eddie? Yeah. Wow. Eddie Taduri, uh, Yard Gavrilovich. Gavrilovich. Yeah, yeah. I see if some other folks you know. Um, Joe Franco. Joe Franco. Yeah. Man. And I haven't seen these guys in years. See, this is why it's great we're doing this today, because they feel the same way about you, like me, and it's just good to see you. It's great to see you. Well, it's great to be seen. Uh, you know, three years of a pandemic, man. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you, it really, you know, I. what's crazy, though, is that uh, I... At first, I started thinking, okay, I'm going to use this time wisely. I'm going to get in my room and I'm going to get everything back together the way it should have been and all that whole thing. And um, and then they kept changing the time. Remember that? They kept saying, no, it'll be yeah. probably weeks or uh, maybe a few months. And then other people would say, they're crazy. It's going to be another couple of years. And um, so... I never knew exactly, you know, none of us ever. And in the meantime, we're living our lives alone, you know, panicky about people coming around. I had, uh, we had our little pod here in the local neighborhood, you know, our, our good friend, Ben Mont, yeah. piano player, and, um, and his beautiful little family, Alice and Catherine, and they would come over every Sunday. And they were the only people, you know, except for our sons and our daughter. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they didn't even come inside. You know, we were outside all the time. And so um, anyway, I mean, I'm just I'm rattling on here about it. the same thing that everybody has gone through. Yeah. But yeah. Um, but what what the sad thing is that uh, three years have gone by and I, my room is still in the same shape as it was. when. It, <laughs> that's pitiful, really. You know, I mean, I, 
did all that time. But, and the other thing is, I have become really used to not having to go anywhere or do anything. And this, this kind of thing really tells you who you are, you know. I always thought, yeah, I'm a sociable person and everything. I'm not really that sociable, I, I, I found out, you know. <laughs> and, and, you know, my wife, fortunately, is, is a lot like me. You know, I, I trained her over the years. And so, uh, you know, we both uh, we're, we're kind of happy just to be with ourselves, you know. <laughs> I it's, dig. It's, it's a strange thing, man. Everybody is treating everybody differently, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I have it's I, opened up now, and so I'm talking about something that doesn't even matter anymore to most people, I guess. No, but I know what you're saying, and and, and to, to put a cap on it, Jim, I I was at PASIC this past week out in Indianapolis, and I saw Greg Bissonette and Peter Erskine and a bunch of our old friends, and we were all saying the same thing, you know, like this is the yep. first time a lot of us have come out of our shell. I caught a little cold there, but thankfully that's all I got. But um, and then this morning, I have to tell you, I had an email from Stan Lynch. And I happened to mention I was going to see you. We were doing this today, and he said, oh, man, give him my love. When you mentioned Ben, Ben Tench, made me think of Stan, and he said, uh, he's my Moses. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I knew, I knew those guys when they were kids, literally kids. Yeah. So, you know, we go way back. Yeah. And Stan is one of my favorite drummers, man. Me too, yeah. In, in Charlie Watts style, in the cross between Ringo and Charlie. Absolute dead on. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of those guys, I have to tell you, so of course, uh, leading up to this, I did a bit of a deep dive into some Jim Keltner recordings going all the way back to what I believe is your first recording, just my style, Gary Lewis. Yeah. Your first, you know, and I have to tell you, Jim. So I, I mean, I found out many years ago, I think when I read Hal Blaine's book, you wrote the forward and you mentioned in that, that, that was your first session that Hal was kind of on standby yeah, as a backup. And, you know, yeah. admittedly, I think like a lot of drummers, you can sort of dismiss that song as just another sort of just rock and roll beat. But as you do a deep dive, I think, honestly, that was the beginning of the Jim Keltner mystique because it's the, to me, it's a song that's decep deceptively, it sounds simple, but what you're playing on the hi-hat is so steady and so grooving and feeling so good. It's a, it's that thing that you do so well where you hear a song and you go, oh man, it's just two and four. I can do that. And then you try to play it and you make an ass of yourself. And to me, that was that's where that began. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you know, that's really funny to hear you say those things because that you're saying that as a drummer who probably has listened to records, uh, you know, uh, many way more sophisticated records than that. And you've sat down and you've, you've tried to do it, right? Yeah. That's not fair to you. <laughs> I can't do it. You know, no, nobody really can do that. You know, I mean, uh, and I found out that way early on when I discovered Bernard Purdy, uh, yeah. you know, uh, the the stuff he was doing the, like that would and those were the days of radio so <clears throat> um you know we're talking 1967 68 and uh, and he was all over the radio yeah playing with all kinds of different groups you know and uh different kind of grooves and things and uh and i i would i would sit down at i'd be in the car listening and then i'd get home and i'd sit down behind the drums i'd go and I'd try to play that groove and it was like I was crippled or something. You know, I felt so <laughs> terrible. I felt so inadequate. And uh, uh, yeah, you know, uh, but you're right about decep deceptively simple kind of grooves and things. And that's a real good example. Actually, nobody's ever said this before. So I'm glad you, you brought that up. I haven't even thought about it, really. Yeah. I always thought about it in different ways because it was my uh, introduction to the studio, you know, to the real recording studio. And um, I think that was a United, United B. Wow. Yeah. Sure. And, you know, I spent most of my life in United B after that. 
but that was yeah. the first time. and uh and that little that little song uh you know it, it's it's just a little shuffle and but it's got a <clears throat> it's got a, a set of changes you know yeah yeah it it starts here and it goes there and then it goes to another place and it comes back and uh, and and so it it to me those kind of little simple kind of grew what appears like it's going to be simple or or even songs that appear that they're going to be difficult you know oh no there's uh, there's odd bars and there's this and that uh even so if the song has uh a really nice little path of what we call verse chorus mm -hmm. you know verse bridge you know uh outro all, all these kinds of things uh, if that speaks to you in a certain way, that's the whole thing right there. Yeah. And yeah. that's, what, that's, that's what, you know, if I were a teacher teaching somebody how to, how to, you know, do, how do you do recording sessions? How do you, how do you handle it and do this and that and all that? And, and, and so many different kinds of songs and having to do so many different things that all the time, what I would say is, you know, you, you, you must learn early that the song talks to you the song will tell you everything you need to know and hopefully if you're fortunate like me and you know to to have been able to play on so many great songs yeah. you know by great songwriters and gifted singers and the whole thing and a producer you put the whole thing together in the fantastic studio and all that you can't lose all you have to do is lose yourself in the song and the song will take you through you know th that's uh, so Man. for that reason I, I you know i would tell somebody uh, and nobody's asking me this this is not a master class or something about recording but I, I would say the the key to playing your instrument really well whatever you play whatever instrument you play is to fall in love with music in such a way that you can't get away from it you just are constantly listening and for enjoyment there's going to be there's going to be the enjoyment period and there's going to be the study period you know that's the way it's been for me anyway yeah i yeah. still love and still will cry to this day when i hear the songs early on that affected me the most and it could be because it's when i first started when i first met my wife mm -hmm. it's, it's it's you know before i fell in love with her or it could be, you know, it could be, you know, all kinds of different various things. Or it could just be a simple thing like listening to Purdy play a song and go, oh, my God, oh, that's so good. I can't stand it. And, um, and then you move on and you go on from there. And then years later, you hear that song. Yeah, I... I, I... I know exactly, exactly what you're saying. And, and I know I've seen, Jim, I've seen quotes. By the way, I have to tell you, Robin Flans is watching. Um, Chris oh, Parker. Good. Chris Parker's watching. John Ferraro, they all send their love, say hello. Um, Jeez, that's... Yeah. All my good friends. And they're not watching because of me, Great. let me just tell you. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. But I, I've heard, I've heard, I've read quotes from you where you talk about um, playing on knocking on heaven's door and and it bringing a tear to your eye and and i can i can totally 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 get that because when i hear that song it evokes this man it just it it just comes out of you you know what i mean it's just it's so beautiful it's so elegant and yeah. well it you know that song and and i've i've said this so many times it's, it's probably a bore you know to to no. people it's so many times but uh, but but what's interesting to me is it's never boring to me because because it was such a it wasn't just the song it was the fact that this lady this actress Katie Gerardo she was she had eyes like my mama huh. and and my mom you know oh fuck I better not carry on here i'll start crying 
We, no, we changed the subject. I can't be talking about my mom right now. I'll lose it. Okay. All right. Uh, no, well, anyway, that's 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 that was a huge part of why that thing happened. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. All right. Well, I I wanted I wanted to just mention that song anyway, and you you sort of led me to it, so we can I'll move on from that. But I just you know like yeah. so many others, it's it's such a favorite of mine that I I you know I have all these iTunes playlists. And and that's on a bunch of them. You know, I go for runs. It's it could be in my Keltner. It could be in my, um, you know, I have all these different seventies, sixties playlists, and and uh, that's always in yeah. there. It's such a beautiful song. But but so that's... I have to, I have to tell you, I was looking at at a YouTube video of of the concert uh, for Bangladesh with you and Ringo double drumming, mm-hmm. and it don't come easy. And I haven't seen that. I remember seeing that as a kid, you know, when, when the movie came out in the 70s. And I don't know if you've watched it lately, um, but, you know, the tempo is about 140 BPM. <laughs> I don't know if you remember this, but at one point, I just have to tell you this, Jim, and I, I'll send you the link when we're done. At one point, I, I made a note at 1 minute 56 seconds when it goes to the instrumental to George's solo. Ringo turns to you because the camera's on Ringo the whole time because he's singing. He turns to you sideways and you can see him mouthing to you fast, like and kind of <laughs> laughing, thinking like, yeah, man, I'm playing it way too fucking fast, <laughs> like apologizing oh. to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, that again. I got to see that again. I, I, I need to revisit a whole bunch of things that are fun. Uh, I just saw Ringo the other night we we were at a uh a poetry reading oh man of olivia's olivia harrison yeah the uh, lovely olivia she just uh oh, she beautiful she knocked it out of the park i i i knew we had heard some of the things that she had written before you know there's a couple of dinners and things and uh she had she read them and it was you know it was nice and it was wonderful and everything but this thing Sitting there, uh, listening to her read these things, you just realize she's like a, she was like George. She's like George's equal in a way with words. I mean, it was phenomenal. Wow. And uh, and the sad thing is that George George never heard those things. Yeah. George passed before he he she was able to share this stuff. Anyway. It was a really beautiful evening, and Ringo was there. All the drum, but a whole, whole bunch of people were there that night. Uh, kind of family type, you know. Yeah, yeah. Ray Cooper and uh, and John Densmore uh, oh, sat man. in. He sat in with his uh, Doombeck, and he played like a you know like a little jazz kind of what, what they used to call that you know like a little. Uh, uh, Poetry reading with the with the guy with the oh, beret. Yeah, the, yeah. Like uh, uh I know what you mean. Like uh yeah. yeah. But he but he 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 just it was beautiful. It was real sensitive the way he played. And uh uh anyway, and Ringo and I were standing there together. We were standing there with our wives, and uh and I'm just enthralled. I, I can't believe the way she's stringing these incredible words together and, and then making them come together and, and clash in this beautiful rhyme and then go off and, you know, it was like George in a way, you know, when he would get like that. With, and uh, and then, but then I looked at Ringo and Ringo was going like, he's like already grooving to the thing. He's got, <laughs> uh, I was going to tell her later and I forgot to tell her, I said, you should, uh, maybe you should uh, set this to a groove, you know? Yeah, yeah. Your, your friends play some play some uh, real, you know, drums and stuff behind you. But yeah, but Ringo, Ringo is in fantastic shape. You know, he had to cancel his tour. Yeah, and uh, so it's the first time I've seen him uh, since around that time, and he just he's just a bundle of energy, man. You know, and he looks great, and and he's but he needed the time. I think he he's relishing this time. You know. Then he's going to and hit it hard. He, I, when you see this, you know, when you see the video, which I know you haven't seen in a while, it's when he turns sideways to look at you, I see Zach's face perfectly. 
because he's you know he's oh, yeah. he's, he's like 30 or 31 or something in this video and and uh, I, it's just, you know, he's got yeah. the beard, big beard, and he just, it looks, ju he looks just like Zach, and, but he mouths the word fast. And I could swear when, <laughs> when you get out of the, when you get out of the instrumental, when you get into the last verse, you've, you've pulled the tempo back a couple of clicks. I think because, you know, you're playing, you're, you're obviously driving the, the boat there and uh, the bus, and, and you can feel it just very gradually sort of come back a little more to the, normal tempo i i just as a drummer it fa that stuff just fascinates me to know yeah I'm... interesting now you got me really curious i'm gonna have to check it out yeah it's, it's yeah that, yeah and, and zach, zach starkey man zach is is playing his butt too. yeah amazing is he ever i know I, I haven't seen him in a couple of years he came through here a few years ago and i went and saw him with the who and and uh yeah, he's just the perfect guy, the perfect guy for that band. I mean, it's yeah, like, that's right. And just yeah, he he uh, he was like that when he was a kid. I remember, and and then uh, to see him grow up like that and and become a badass, you know, it's it's fantastic. That happened great. to another friend of mine who just passed, a uh, bass player named Wolfgang Meltz. Yeah, he, we played together with Gabor. And uh, we did quite a lot of stuff back in the day, way back in the day. And his son, his little boy, Reinhardt, was uh, was just, he was just a little kid, you know. And then, and I lost track of, you know, Wolfgang and, you know, the way his lifestyle and everything. I lost track of the whole family and all that. And then these years later, my friend Bobby Torres, who is the conga player, uh, played uh, in uh, Mad Dogs and Englishmen, and Bobby's a lifelong friend. And uh, he was very, very close with uh, Wolfie and, uh, and Reinhardt and that whole family. And uh, he played me something. And I said, Who, who's playing the drums? He said, that's Reinhardt. That's, that's uh, Wolfie's son. Wow. I could not believe it. So... It's amazing when the you know when the kids come up and uh, yeah, yeah and they blow your mind you know I I know no I know it's uh, and there's so many you know as as we know every year you know you go to a NAMM show or something like that and you see some new hate to sound like my dad but you know young kid that's just like are you kidding me you know it's, it's oh yeah uh, yeah so, there, there's a who said. Oh, I don't know. We we will get started, but but yeah, that it is amazing what's what's going on, and not just drumming. Uh, my wife, she calls, she yells at me, "Come here, quick! You got to see it." And she's watching uh, The Voice or America's Got Talent or I don't know what what one of the <laughs> and and there's like a little kid, just a little tiny little a baby, and he's singing like Otis Redding. I mean, yeah. You know, I mean, it's just uh, that's yeah. And the little girls sounding like Aretha. You know, little babies, amazing, amazing, amazing. But, you know, talking about that part. I mean, this is this is not just about drums, right? No, this is about music. It's about anything you want to talk about. Jim. I don't. I don't want to get political. That that'd be a horrible thing to do to everybody right now. But but I will say this: uh, the the young people that i and i'm i'm going by by what i know firsthand like like i have a 17 year old grandson yep and this kid is brilliant this kid is so smart and and then i'm hearing things about what he what he's doing he's like he's an honor student you know he's still in high school and he's an honor student he's about ready to graduate and uh uh, and from there, I'm hearing about all these other all these other kids, and, and you see it. If you start to sort of pay attention, you you start to see when you see young people interviewed on TV or for any kind of thing. It could be like at an accident scene, or or just you know interviewed for some kind of thing in school or whatever. You hear them talk, and you see it's just, this is like. These these people, these young people, are like where we were. My generation was, as young adults already out in the world. You know, it's yeah. it's bound to. That's just uh, evolution, right? I mean, that's just the way it, it's supposed to work. But the young people are smarter, more informed now. 
than they've ever been. And, uh, and, and it's really astonishing um, to see what they can possibly do. Look what's happening over around the other parts of the world with young people. Yeah. Young yeah. people are, are saying, look, you know, uh, I, uh, we want, we want to be free. And they're going to make it their business to make that happen all around the world. Yeah. Including right here where we are already free. Look what they did just the other day. Now I'm getting political. So I, <laughs> I'll stop right there. <laughs> well, okay. I, I want to, I want to read you a couple of comments here really quickly. Yeah. Um, Eddie, Eddie had said something, but I'm going to read you something from your neighbor, Joe Goldberger. Oh, yeah. So, hey, Jim, it's Joe Goldberger, your neighbor from around the corner. I have to say every time I've run into Jim, he's the kindest, friendliest, and most humble person I've ever met, which is refreshing considering his stature and status. So, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. thank you. That's really, that's really sweet. And that's you. That's, that, anybody that knows you, that's 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 you all the way. I, I have to, uh, I have a couple more songs I want to just kind of talk to you about, but um, I wanted to just show you this photo, which we've talked about before um, of our dear friend. And uh, I know you had told me that, let's see if I can figure this out, Jim. I'm, I'm uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, this was the last time that you had seen Charlie at Hal's 90th birthday party. Wow. And uh, I, I just I just have to tell you, I love this. I love this photo so much because it's both of you guys. You know, it's it's you, you are every bit as much of a hero to me as Charlie was and and uh, and and a friend and, and a brother. And I just remember that night and I just want to tell you it. I can remember vividly coming to the I got to the baked potato early and I got to chat with Hal for a little while before it got crazy there. And um, and then I, I saw Denny Tedesco sitting at the bar, kind of just having a drink. And, you know, the baked potato, there's that step you go up from the from the level, the, the regular level. You go up a step to the bar. Yeah. So as I go up that step, I literally walk into Charlie like we walk into each other face to face. And I had this like surprised look on my face. And, he, you know, Charlie goes, hello, John. <laughs> and he says to me, the first thing he says is, where's Keltner? <laughs> oh. And I said, I haven't seen him. I don't know if he's coming. I, I, and he said, oh, he's coming. I talked to him. He's going to be here. I said, oh, great. And he said, where's Hal? And I brought him down to see Hal. And they had a, you know, a few moments together. And they were chatting before it got crazy. And then you showed up. And about that time, as you remember, all hell broke loose. It was just, you know, you couldn't move in there. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That that's a that's a, that is a beautiful picture, man. And and Charlie, Charlie seemed so healthy then, you know. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, I know, I know. It's uh, it's a yeah. And I I I just and I remember when you and I spoke after we lost Charlie. I, I we talked about this night, and you said. You know that was the last time you actually saw him, and and uh, I saw him a, f a few months later when they played when they were on tour that summer. Uh, yeah, but um, but I you know I I guess what I'm getting at is that I, I think of you as the as the you know the link to Charlie to Ringo to Levon to all the guys you know all the you know all the greats and uh, and and we're all so glad you're still here making music and and uh, you know it's, well. You know, when you mentioned uh, you mentioned Charlie, Ringo, and and Hal, and and uh, Levon, and those guys, those those icons, man. You know, those guys will live on forever through the music. You know, which is yeah. which is really amazing. It's remarkable that, and you will learn. It's, it's funny about like with with Ringo for me, I I always I I went from Hal and Earl Palmer, you know I I saw those guys routinely, you know they were L.A. stalwarts, you know they they were 
they played on all the records and and I would see them from time to time and I would always try to you know get them to talk to me and and all that and 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 they were and it was always great and uh and then and then when Ringo you know Ringo I didn't want to like Ringo I didn't want to like the Beatles I didn't <laughs> want any of that stuff and uh and uh and then when it became really apparent that I couldn't avoid it you know and I mean it just especially as I started to making playing on records and stuff I realized that's the that's the actual template right there and um and so uh so from going from Hal and Earl to Ringo uh and then really beginning to appreciate uh what it was that Ringo was doing and and obviously knowing that uh you know he was playing with you know some of the greatest songwriter singers in the world ever yeah, ever yeah and then and then charlie you know i met them all around the same time and charlie talk about friendly and humble and warm and all that listen man i mean charlie watts charlie watts was like the the most amazing gentleman i've ever known in my life i think i think everybody would agree with that ringo number one all of them yeah and uh and yet i couldn't i knew that i liked the hit records i knew that i liked the records when i'd hear them on the radio because you know that was like i say that was the template but i didn't appreciate charlie's playing or his contribution to that until later and it it was and so now at this advanced point in my life i can tell you that that uh that uh ringo and charlie are guys who are not known to be able to play really beautiful press roles and things like that like uh, you know like educated drummers do mm -hmm. like formally educated drummers do and and i consider myself a formally educated not i didn't go to college like you know dave weckel and and some of the other guys you know who are are, are my dear friends and and i and i applaud and up uh, and just support in every way possible you know the fact that they have taken drumming to this place to this amazing place you know uh terry and thomas and and all those guys sure vinnie and everybody. but but um but the thing is that uh the 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 uh amount of education you receive as a musician uh is is i think that it's important but obviously and we all know this has been talked about many many times you know it's it's, it's uh hi babe my wife just walked in oh how did um, you? so uh you know you you it's it's the heart and and the soul it's the heart and the brain together that really uh you know makes this music happen makes this music come out of you and and make you be this vessel that is you know really uh people highly regarded or or people love it people uh, think it's okay whatever but it's the it's the uh it's a combination really of the heart the soul and what education you have received and of course obviously your body of experience you know where where are you coming from where did you uh you know were you did you play in little clubs you know did you did you what did, what did you do how did you come up you know all of that stuff plays into everything but with charlie and ringo those were the two for the and then i'm gonna have to add another drummer in there a, a german named chuck blackwell sure. who i don't know if if hardly anybody knows chuck because he talk about uh wonderful human being and and humble and all that chuck was every bit of that and and 
and also another one of those drummers who I was on the road with him with the uh, Mad Dogs and Englishman. Uh, you know, he was Leon Russell's drummer for many years. So he was part of that family that I, I've been part. I was a part of for a long time. Leon's whole thing. And but he was also another one of those that I didn't appreciate his drumming skills. I didn't appreciate it until later. Now, at this point in time, I go back. Uh, uh, his wife actually sent me uh, a shin dogs. Uh, uh, I think you ever hear of the shin dogs? No, you wouldn't. Have yeah. that. Shin dogs was a, uh, uh, a, you know, a Hollywood band, you know, played back in, in the early days, of early rock. stuff, And, uh, and he was the drummer with them. And when you listen to the way he played back in those days, uh, it's the same school. Uh, that Charlie and Ringo came out of. It's that same kind of thing. And, and it's, it's, it's not copyable. You right. cannot copy that. And I know, and I'm an educated drummer to some degree, you know, yeah. not copy, like I said before, but I, I, if anybody could copy somebody, it should be me, somebody like me. I could never copy Ringo. I could never copy Charlie and I could never copy Chuck uh, or Jimmy Carstein was the other guy. These two guys were from Tulsa, Oklahoma, my hometown. Yeah. And yeah. I could never copy any of them. And, and I wanted to really badly, <laughs> well, but that's the way it is. But you're one of those guys too, Jim. You are, you're one of those guys that can't be copied. You know, I mean, it, you, you may think well, you are, but you're not. You you can't be. What that tells us, you know, is that, you know, we're all the individual that we are and what we bring to the table musically is the deal. That's the deal. Well, and I just only one of them, you know, there's only one of you. Yeah, well, I, I have to tell you, so we, you and I were on the phone a month or so ago. I was on my way to band rehearsal and I'd mentioned my band was going to be working on Josie that night. And I remember you said to me, you, you laughed, you said, make sure you get that crack out of that snare. And, uh, yeah. and, and that to me, you know, I bought this thinking that it would help me play like you, but <laughs> it, it doesn't do shit. <laughs> do shit. Uh, I, I'm going to get my money back because it's yeah. supposed to... <laughs> To get your money back on that, man. No, no way. I'm kidding. I love um, this. I love this. But anyway, the, you know, I, I, I had to use that as a prop to just say, you know, we all, we all want to, we all want to be Jim Keltner, right? Um, to... You know, it, that's that's a great, that, that's a great thing. You know, to it, it's it's tremendous to have uh, to know you're loved. You know, and I know all my friends love me, man. I I know that, and I and and that's. How could I not want to spread that kind of love? You know what I'm saying? I know, I know. I think it's so important, you know, especially in this world today, especially. It's always been important, but, you know, that's what we're here to do, man. Spread the love, yeah. you know? I, I think, you know, and I, I think the older we get, it becomes even more about that than maybe even anything else, right? I mean, it's, it's just, yeah, it just feels that way. Yeah, absolutely. I, by the way, you mentioned Dave. I saw Weckl at, he was at PASIC also. It was this incredible lineup of guys this year. And Dave just continues to play his butt off, man. He is just something. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Dave, 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 uh, Charlie loved Dave Weckl. And so when Charlie would come to town, if, if Dave was playing, man, we'd be there. Yeah. Charlie make me pick him up and we'd go down there. <laughs> And, and then we talked today uh, afterwards, you know, and all. Charlie was a big champion, man, of, of the, of the, uh, the, you know, drummers that were like Dave, you know, the, the guys that were just the opposite of a Charlie Watts or me, yeah. Yeah. you know, uh, and, and I, and we had many conversations about that, about how it's really unfair and not a good thing to, to hear drummers talk about other drummers as being paid by the note 
you know, if they were paid by the note, they'd be wealthy. You know, we heard that for, I heard that all my life coming up, you know, and, and I would know what they were talking about. Yeah. But fortunately at some point uh, I realized, no, man, that's, you know, for somebody to take the art in this case of drumming to such a high level, that is to be not only supported, but, you know, just exalted. I mean, come on, yeah. you know, Dave is beautiful like that. And then, you know, you hear somebody like Thomas Lang, man. I I I, uh, I tuned in uh, the other day. I uh, I couldn't make it down to the uh, DW thing, so I tuned in online. Mm. And I happened to come in with Terry Bozio talking, and Terry is one of my dearest friends. And and I love Terry Bozio. Jesus, talk about educated man. Yeah. I mean, this man is a is a PhD. And so he's talking. And he's playing a little bit, you know, and then they move over. The camera moves over to Thomas, Thomas Lang. And Thomas, you know, he just, just this, the energy is going to just burst out of this, his veins. If he, and so then he's talking and he's explaining and he's playing and he's talking and he's playing. And it's like, where did this how does this happen? How can you become, how can you be a, a human being? Because Thomas is a nice guy. He's a real nice guy and he's fun yeah. to be around and he's smart and, and, he, and he's sensitive, you know, uh, and yet he turns into a machine. <laughs> he turns into like a stainless steel machine. Yeah. Yeah. Right. In your eyes. And you go, what? How is that possible? <laughs> And uh, and so it just it blows my mind. I love it. Yeah. I, I love it so much, man. You know, uh, occasionally uh, an old friend, uh, David Garfield, a great keyboard player, sure. will send me something that he that he recorded maybe you know back 30, 40 years ago. I, it seems ridiculous to say that like that, but uh, and it'll be like a a song, and it will be. Uh, a version with Jeff Percaro on it from like 1982 or something. And then a version with uh, Carlos uh, and uh, Carlos Vega. Yeah. And a version with Vinny. Right. Mm. And then a version with, uh, with Abe Jr. Because, you know, the, the latest one with Abe Jr. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because he's been playing with his dad, you know, Abe Laborio. We all played with Abe Laborio Sr., you know, the great bass player. We played, I played many times in the studio with him. A beautiful, beautiful person. Yeah. Beautiful man, beautiful uh, musician. Uh, and, uh, and his son now, you know, just, you know, blowing everybody's mind. So, yeah. but. But to see, to, to, hear, to hear the difference in somebody's interpretation, I love that kind of stuff, you know? That's um, great, yeah. Jeff, yeah. Yeah, Jeffrey was like real, you know, real kind of uh, just, just pocket, you know, pocket and feel. And then Carlos came on, and, and Carlos played the same kind of thing as Jeff, except with a little bit of, you know, he's Latin, Carlos, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. So he, there was a little bit of another kind of thing going on, uh, a little bit of a dance kind of thing. And then Vinny came on. And <laughs> Vinny, Vinny, like, right away, right out of the shoot, man, it's like, you can't hold him back. And he's, but the stuff that he played was so beautiful and perfect. Yeah. yeah. It, yep. was, it was perfection for that thing that he was doing. And so there's no way that you could say, you know, uh, it was too busy or it was this or too that or whatever, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's just a wonderful thing to be able to appreciate, uh, you know, the, the, the vast, uh, array of, uh, drumming skills that there yeah. are in the band. Per um, personalities. Yeah, you're right. And you mentioned Jeff and I was going to jump back a second. And when you were talking about, when you're talking about like Charlie and, uh, and, and Ringo and guys that weren't necessarily um, really schooled, educated, formally educated drummers, right? Uh, but had this uniqueness and and you know Jeff obviously had a little bit more with his with his dad's influence. He had a little bit more schooling. But would you? 
I put Jeff in that category too of like this unique. Um, I know you've talked a lot about him, and when you first heard him play, just how incredibly unique he was. And you, were, of course, were his mentor, you and Jim Gordon, and and to some degree Hal. And oh, absolutely, well, you know Jim. I mean, it's. I told him. I told him uh, many times early on. I told him, uh, don't, don't, don't listen to me. I mean. If I, I understand you like this song and you like that song. You know, he'd, he'd play songs that he liked that I played on. I said, but don't don't listen to me as much as you should like Jim Gordon. Listen to all of Jimmy's stuff. Because, because the thing is that Jeff, and I said that for, for this reason, because Jeff loved to, we'd be in the car, you know, we'd be like we'd either be in the same studio, him in another room, me in another room, and or or we would it'd be all, well, there was always a, 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 a close proximity. We so we would be sitting in the car listening uh, to stuff. I'd play him things, and he'd play me things, and then he he got to where he was playing me stuff. Like he'd play me something, and and then he'd look at me. <laughs> so like like what? And he said. <laughs> That's me doing you. And I go, oh, Jeff. You know, and he would play these like squirrely things and stuff, you know. And uh, and so, Jeff, listen, you better, you don't, you don't, don't spend your time listening to, to the way I played. Listen to Jimmy Gordon. And it worked, man, because, you know, he got, he got that beautiful discipline that Jim had and, uh, and, and the flawless time, you know, the the beautiful beautiful time and the and the real like uh uh, uh uh you know the the um the the shit, i'm losing my word I'm, I'm trying to find the word uh jeffrey when he played he played with such confidence and i mean and, and, and such a it, it was it was confidence with him because he was a very confident young man and focus he, maybe he, is that the word too jim maybe if he's... Uh, but uh no that's uh it, it'll come to me later <laughs> but but the point is that uh every every note that jeffrey played had its place it it it, it meant something it was it was that was that was what that was the beauty of his playing that that's what that was part of the beauty of jim gordon's playing uh that's the beauty of of guys that can do that like you know i i have i for myself i don't consider myself to have developed that skill as much as i could have i'll say it like that mm. because uh, part of the reason I this may sound squirrely, but uh, hey, you know we're doing a Zoom about about this, so we might as well. <laughs> uh, part of the reason for that was because I I wanted to play more like Levon than Jim Gordon, if that makes any sense. Absolutely to, does. Yeah, and and yet. My work, what I did for a living, was playing on records, which is what Jimmy Gordon did. And Levon didn't play on people's records. Levon played on his records. Yeah. So I had to dance. I had to do, be in two different worlds. And, and so for that reason, I never developed that focus or that... that uh, that thing that it takes to uh, to be an exact, to be able to play exactly what I mean to play, that kind of attitude. If that makes any sense, I don't know if I'm making any sense there with anybody. But yeah. But so so the fact that I that I knew that I didn't do that as good as Jimmy or my little brother Jeff. And which, you know, Jeff would just scream at me sometimes. He would yell at me, you know, the, when I would tell him, you know, how good, great he was, you know, and he surpassed everybody. He, he hated hearing that. 
but it was true. And, and I think he knew it somewhere in deep inside. He knew that. But the thing is that uh, uh, because I couldn't do that, uh, I went ahead and just played my version of that. And, and that's, you know, that's speaking to everybody who's listening to this. All the guys that are listening to this right now probably are, you know, you, you mentioned some of the names. Those are guys, I, I know all those guys, and they're all great players. And yes. they should, you know, we should all know that the, the beauty of this whole thing is that we play ourselves. We cannot play anything else. Jeffrey couldn't do me. And I, and I, and because I, because I was like, he was my little brother. I was able to tell him that. Yeah. yeah. Even though he didn't want to hear it necessarily, but I told him all the stuff that was very important. I know. And I know he listened and you hear the results. And the fact that he got out of here at the age of 38 and we talk about him like this, that in itself is phenomenal. Can you imagine what he would have done, where he would have gone? I, I always felt like, I always, I always knew, I told his brothers and his family, and everybody, I, I, I knew that he was headed to be like one of the great producers. He would have been a great producer who played drums great. Yeah. That's yeah. what he would have been, because that's that's the way his mind worked, and you know, absolutely, but, yeah. Uh, no, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful, and and I know you know you can get really deep when you talk about Jeff, and and mm. I think that's beautiful what you said, and and uh, yeah, I mean, but but I you know I I hear like uh, what little uh, uh, sort of. Uh, how can I put it? How can I say it so it makes sense? But what little bit I can sort of decipher in my in in my mind, I, you know, I, I hear a lot of your influence in Jeff's playing. Um, you know, no, he's he's not a, co a a copy of you, but but I think it's a great. You can tell that you were an influence to him. And um, well, he what he was 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 a, a a product of of who I turned him on to. You know, don't forget I turned him on to Purdy. Yeah. Yeah, he never he didn't know anything about that. And I played him. I played it was about three years after I discovered Purdy. And then uh, and then when I played it for him one night, one of those nights sitting in the car, man, I said, listen to this. And he just peed on himself, man. He was like, what? <laughs> wow. And, and uh, like, uh, it, it, you know, he. And then I would play him another thing later on, you know, about uh, there, there were a bunch of Purdy stuff that I, you know, and uh, but that had nothing to do with the uh, with the rock steady thing or the uh, or the the I mean, I could we could get technical and it, it was the Purdy shuffle back then, too. But yeah. but it wasn't the it wasn't the, the Purdy that that surfaced in the world, you know, like he, that wasn't the, the Purdy that I discovered and so then when jeffrey started listening to all the stuff that purdy had you know the modern the, uh, the later day stuff that purdy was doing you know that's when he formulated that whole thing yeah and you know. came like uh and you know and, and was able to incorporate that into his own music and uh but but the feel the the that that beautiful pocketed feel that's a huge part of bernard purdy you hear in jeff Bocaro. yeah you know i i think in 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 a way i think my biggest influence on jeffrey was not necessarily drumming well uh, yeah it was a stuff and uh and uh and but you know but he he just wasn't uh it wasn't meant for him to uh to go on any further than he did, you know, he, uh, who knows about that kind of stuff, you know, mm, yeah. he, he leaves here at, at the age of 38, John Lennon, a person who I've thought of so many times, so much of the time in, in all this time, uh, this gone by, I've thought, uh, what, what would he be like? My wife and I talk about him all the time. We, we used to love hanging out. He would come here, 
sometimes or you know he was the first person in our house that we live in now wow that's a story i've told that many times but but john was uh the type of person who you just you could just imagine what he would be like as an older guy if he was still around i know stuff that he would have done after that to be cut down at 40 40 i mean you know the just imagine what he would have done man what a, what a, i mean he was so gifted it was un, unbelievable but he was just a just a beautiful curious cat he loved he loved america he loved i mean it sounds corny but he loved anything united states he loved he he just wanted to soak it up uh and you know because that was really basically what created the beatles yeah american rock and roll and uh their love for it you know yeah well i'm all over the place here. i don't no, know man no no jim i i this is it's 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 you and it's freestyle and and you mentioned john and i was going to get to just some of the brilliant work you did with john and, and i and i i do want to get to that in a second but a couple of songs i i just wanted to just touch on for a second and you know I, ahead of this i just want you to know i started thinking about a million recordings and i thought ah, this this is, we could go on for two days doing that so i'm i promise i'm not going to do that but um a couple of my favorite songs i i know i mentioned josie and, and i and i'll even come back to that one too but um dreamweaver by gary wright is to me uh, again another masterpiece in drumming i think it's just it's so beautiful what you play on that song and i've always wondered um was it just you and gary in the studio it's doing that yeah. song gary and david foster and david foster okay yeah david was the key david foster was the key to dreamweaver uh you listen to the way he played and uh he didn't produce it though. He 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 played. Oh yeah, he did. He did produce it. Oh. He produced with Gary. I see. Okay. Gary. And uh, that's another long story, man. We just saw Gary, David, and I drove down to see him. And uh, you know, remember Gary in your prayers. All okay. Ago. I, yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, uh, yeah. That that. <laughs> That little Dreamweaver song, it's just it, it's it's just the simplest of all little grooves, you know. But like you say, deceptively simple. Absolutely. And the key, the key to that for the drums was David Foster's piano. Okay. And and you really need as a drummer, as a drummer, you really really need to have people. Uh, elevate you and the way they elevate you the way they elevate the drums is is by playing some bad ass stuff man and i've been so fortunate for that man i mean over the years to have played with some of the baddest people in in the i did a an interview for mojo not long ago and they said five give us five of uh, tracks that you like and i said five tracks oh, no, i can't do that and i refused <laughs> to do it because i said no I can't, I'm sorry, I just can't do play that game. I, I uh, 10 would be too hard. Too hard, Cause yeah. Because many that I love, you know, and and, uh, and if I say this one and I don't say that one, I'm going to hate it and everything. But I started thinking about it and I thought, okay, then. I said, all right, so what I'll do is I'll eliminate the Beatles. I mean, any, you know, I'll eliminate any of those guys. I'll eliminate, uh, you know, the... Uh, the stuff that everybody knows that I've played on and all that, you know, Dreamweaver and, and uh, Josie and all that stuff, which I love, of course, but uh, I'll do some things that maybe people don't know about. And so as I compile my little list of five, uh, those songs were perfect. I realized while I was doing that, that those songs were perfect examples of what I've been telling people for a long time. It's not about the drums. The magic of a song or a hit song or whatever, it's not the drums that did it. The drums are a part, of, say a hit record, 
the drums are obviously a, a part of that recipe. It's part of what made that cake taste good. But what made the drums come together and happen was some brilliant stuff from the other musicians. Somebody, one cat, two, three, it's even better, or, or whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, like in the case of, uh, of, of uh, this, this track I did, it's back in the 70s uh, for, uh, for Chaka Khan and uh, the band, uh, Rufus. Rufus, yeah. And that was, that was uh, because uh, the reason I got to do that was because, uh, and I've told this story many times, uh, the drummer, um, what the hell? I, I shouldn't tell these stories if I can't remember. Andre, <laughs> sorry, Andre, if you're listening. Andre Fisher, great drummer, good cat, great friend of mine during those days. We were all hanging out and stuff all the time. Andre came to me one morning. Shall I tell this story again, even though I've told it a hundred sure, times? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know this story, so yeah, please. So he comes to me at Record Plant. We're hanging out. And uh, he says to me, uh, hey, Jimmy, can you play for me tomorrow morning on a track with Rufus? Uh, uh, and he's standing there with his wrist bandaged. And I said, yeah. yeah, well, yeah, well, what happened? And he goes, um, uh, I broke my wrist. I know I, I, uh, I, I sprained my wrist. And, uh, and I said, well, wow, man, how did you do that? What happened? And he said, uh, uh, I hit my wife. And I said, oh, God, Andre, what, why did you do that? And he said, because she stabbed me. I, I'm going, oh, man, hey, I'm sorry to be getting in the middle of your terrible thing here. I, but what the hell did she stab you for? What did you? He said, I had our daughter in my hands, and we, I was walking out of the house. Now, I, you know, I probably shouldn't be saying this story. Like that. I don't know. I, I think I, I didn't tell the whole thing in the past. <laughs> The story. It just sounds so bad now that I'm saying it, but it's only a Zoom. Nobody's going to hear it, right? Uh, so, so he, so, you know, I said, okay, well, sure, Andre, man, what time? 10 o'clock in the morning, okay? Uh, Studio B, record plant. Okay, so I showed up and, uh, and it's just me and Bobby Watson, who was one of the great bass players of all time a part of that badass band, man. Rufus was so killer. And then they happen to have Chaka Khan as their singer. So uh, playing that track that day, uh, it was a challenge because it was quick, it was fast. Mm. And I didn't have a double pedal, but I wanted to play this double bass drum little pattern thing. And so I did it with my one foot. And and like I say, it was, it was quick. And... Uh, and I, I panicked a couple of times, like, oh, no, I'm not going to be able to move. And Bobby was beautiful. He was like, not only played his ass off with the bass, but he was a great producer. And um, so he he hung with me, hung in there with me, you know, and he'd give me a, a few tips here. Don't worry about No, play a fill right there. That's okay. Go ahead. Because I would think, oh, I'm playing it in the wrong spot. He said, no, that's good right there. And he guided me through this thing. And I remember listening and thinking, damn, that's good. That's, I really like that. And then later on, you know, I heard it on the radio and, and, uh, and blew my mind. And, I, and then years later, after not hearing it for a long time, uh, when I hear it, it still knocks me out. And the reason why is because the bass part and the guitar parts and the vocal Chaka, I mean, yeah. nobody sings as badass as Chaka, you know? I mean, yeah. and you put those combinations together and then the little drum part, all the drum has to do is do tack, do tack, do tack, do tack, do tack, do tack. You know, that's all it has to do and it doesn't matter. So that right there is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. And there are many other examples where the drummer, all y'all who might be listening right now, any, all drummers, 
will come alive if they're given something to play. You've got to have something to rise to. And unfortunately, a lot of, a lot of times uh, the people that you're playing with are expecting you to provide the group. That is not to say, Jeffrey and I used to talk about this. Jeff knew exactly what I was talking about and he, he proved it many times. It's, it's not, you know, you have got to have people give you something to rise to. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand that. That, that makes perfect sense. And, and to circle back to Dreamweaver, where you mentioned David's piano part, David Foster's. That, so that's yeah. him playing. I didn't realize. I thought Gary Wright played all the, all the, piano, all okay. the keyboard parts. The spooky stuff, you know, the synth stuff. Yeah. He was, he was uh, David says today even that, uh, that uh, Gary Wright was uh, responsible for his, you know, his, a, a huge part of his career in that he, he, he was the one that introduced him for the first time to uh, synthesize it. Wow. Yeah. Synthesize stuff. Were, were you playing to a click on that, Jim? Was that, was that like, because that sounds like there's sequenced keyboard parts, but maybe Gary just overdubbed a bunch of stuff. I'll tell you what, I don't think there was a click on that. No, uh, it doesn't feel like a click. That was, that was a little before right. click. And that, like that, that, little chaka song was not a click thing you know those guys those guys were just badass man they would they you know play a groove and um yeah i mean that i and i know. asked that Dreamweaver, the time never moves but yet when you play that cross stick part during the verses um i guess it's the first verse when you come in with that little it, it it's like the beat comes back a little bit but it it's not slowing down. It's that magical yeah, playing behind the, the beat. That's the magic of not playing to a click. Yeah. You know, when I, when I get on this bandwagon here about clicks and stuff, I always am afraid that I'm, I'm going to give people wrong information. It's, click is not a bad thing. A click is not your enemy. And, and you can play. To, I've played on many records with clicks that I like, sure. you know, yeah. but not as many as without clicks. That's a, it's a, it's just, a, it's like talking about dogs or rabbits. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. two different things. You know, it's not, it's, it, you, you talk about them in the same way. You know, you can make records uh, uh, of many, many different ways. One of my favorites, as I say, uh, has always been to be able to like, uh, uh, you know, be in a room with, with uh, people and play live uh, because you're playing off of each other. And that way, then you can have a, a a verse or even a chorus or whatever that wants to sit back. Yeah. Great. And then you can have the part of the song that wants to move up. You know, usually it's the chorus that wants to go a little faster. And those guys, like for instance, to get back to Charlie and Ringo, those guys knew that. Yeah. And they did it instinctively. They didn't have to talk about it. It was in instinctive. Uh, uh, those, those those guys like uh the early rock guys yeah, uh, yeah they all would 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 just give it a slight bit of i want to say rush they would give it a little more energy coming into the chorus yeah you know? and you hear that on the rolling stones huge you hear it big time uh you hear it uh on on the beatles uh you hear it on all of any early rock kind of stuff that's the way it was. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Modern, uh, current day rock has been, you know, there's, it's usually been programmed in some kind of way. Somebody has laid down a track or something. And, and uh, but, but if, if people play live in the room and, uh, and they believe it, then that's, that's the best. I think. Yeah. No, but I, amen. They, yeah. Uh, you know, there, there's if you if you're gonna do the I mean my little music that I play up here in my room, uh, that's not a click, but that's program stuff, pre-programmed stuff. You know, I I lay down a thing and and uh, now having said that, um, I had an idea recently for some sounds uh, because I collect sounds, you know, things that that you know tickle my ear, and uh, I'm gonna lay down some tracks that are just just me starting playing a thing, a groove, 
and it won't have anything to do with any kind of a program or, or, you know, it won't be from one of my machines or, and it certainly won't be to a click. That's, that's what the instinct would tell you to do. Okay, well, play to the click. And now you can add all your other stuff to, no, I'm going to do it this way. Yeah. That way I'm going to, and it'll be probably easier for me because I did the original track. I'm going to know where it veers off here, veers off there a little bit, you know, and, um, that's and cool. hopefully what will happen is that'll be where the magic is. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, I just, I, I am going to come back to Josie cause I, I have, I have so many questions about that, but, but to me, an example of what I believe you're playing to a click on is handle with care. The Wilburys. No handle with care. Not there a was click. Yeah. the, the drums that the, the only drums you hear on that are Tom fills, just a few Tom fills. And yeah. those were by uh, Ian Wallace. Oh, my so great you're, oh, beautiful yeah. friend. Oh, well, Ian. Yeah. Yeah. He came in and he overdubbed Tom Phil's, but there's no drums uh, at all on live drums. That was a, that was just an experiment uh, for those guys. They were screwing around. And I think Jeff Lynn, you know, put the thing together with, uh, yeah. Yeah. with, uh, with the machine, you know? Okay. So yeah. Handle with care. Well, and that would that, explain it. Yeah. That whole band traveling Wilburys. After that, everything we did, you know, was we did uh, the the everything that was on the handle with care album. What, what's which album was that? Was the first album? That right? was the first one that had end of the oh, line on it, right? Right, end of the yeah. All those yeah. songs uh, were they they had they it wasn't a click, but there was uh, there was something uh, that was laid down uh, in, in a program fashion that we that we all played to i think i see and the second album which is not called the second album, i think it's called the third album or something <laughs> yeah something like that anyway, yeah yeah the second traveling wilburys album was all live we played in the room together yeah no yeah nothing. that makes sense because i think like you said that first record that was at a time when um yeah someone's saying it was called volume three uh, the second yeah. album, um, yeah. but yeah, that was the first album was done at a time like you said when it was kind of common place standard for for whether it was a machine or you know something to to uh, and I wondered that because it's a it's a perfect one fifteen BPM and I and I I thought oh, maybe that's a you know that's a, an example of you playing to a click but that explains <laughs> it yeah no no you know but you could look you know. Uh, getting back to jeff for a minute you know jeff was an expert at playing to a click and uh and we would talk about that and you know he 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 always felt like you just have to manipulate the click and uh and that's true you know you can sit back on the back side of the click yeah for, for you know to get that backside feeling and and you can sit conversely on top you know to get that kind of now he was right about that 100%, but that's not going to work for all music. That's not going to that has to be a certain kind of uh there has to be a, a certain feel for that to work in my estimation. Yeah. I mean, you know, we can all it, we, most of us drummers have played the clicks, you know, many times. And so we they know what I'm talking about. Everybody knows what I'm talking about when they sit behind it or sit on top of it. But that's not uh that's not the same as as uh, playing live and everybody pulling back just a little bit here for the for this verse just to get a vibe a thing going you know and then get up here for the chorus you know it's yeah. a, a click will not allow you to do that exactly yeah, although it's... there have been people who manipulate the click you know before they anyway that's another whole thing it's <laughs> not worth talking about a couple of quick no jim this is this is thank you again for doing this too this is just so great people are enjoying this and um as i am as you can tell oh, that's, that's good. thank you that's... um do you remember what snare drum i you know this is the the only sort of geeky gear question i'll ask if you remember the snare that you used on josie yeah very very well i mean that was a uh that i took a uh i had a um somehow i acquired and i don't know where I got it, uh, but I had a an original Black Beauty. Oh man! A, a five 
five. So it wasn't a, a deep yeah. one. Yep. It was a, like five inch, five and a half inch black beauty, but original black beauty with the etching, the whole thing. Oh. And in my ignorance, I... I tried tuning it. I wanted to play it real good. They said, oh, it was about, you got a black Ludwig there, black beauty Ludwig there. Fantastic. I played it. I could not be happy with it. Anything I did, I tried calf head. I tried everything I did. I changed the snares. It just didn't have it for me. It wasn't, it wasn't doing anything for me. So I took it to the drum shop, drum shop. And uh, Bob Yeager, who was, uh, you know, the owner and the yeah. and the great supporter of all of us guys, you know, and he loved me and, and he'd say, "Hey Jimmy, what's what's going on?" I said, "Hey Bob, I I have this this drum and I know it looks kind of shitty, but it's it's a it's a black beauty." And I said, "Can I trade this for something? Let me go like over the." He used to have a little stand with uh, with a bunch of snare drums on it. They still do. Mm -hmm. and uh, can I go over there and pick one out and, and trade this for you? And he goes, yeah, go ahead. So I went over and I just tapped on things and I, I heard, I tapped on this one. It was a plexiglass Ludwig. Oh yeah. Super sensitive. Like a, a, the clear, the Vistalite? The, yeah, Vistalite, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, a Vistalite, super sensitive. Okay. As crisp as it could possibly be. I'm going, I'm going, oh God. <laughs> and so so I took Bob, this one here. And he goes, Man, you sure you want that's a that's a, like a $90 drum, man. You know, there's some in there that are better than more expensive. I said, I like the sound of this thing. So uh I took it and I I don't know how long I had it. I didn't have it very long before I played with, with them on that, but uh but when I look back, uh, the thing that, that kind of is funny to me is that why would I, I mean, Steely Dan, you know, uh, I think Gary Katz called me for, you know, to go in there. And, I, and Steely Dan, like, that's a, that's a record I should be really, I, I got to go in, I got to get the right snare drum, the right thing. But for some reason, I didn't have that feeling. I just had this little drum and I said, I'm going to play, the, I'm going to play this drum. Now that, I don't know that, uh, that was a pretty wicked little move on my part. I, I don't, <laughs> because, because it, you know, it should have been a more, you know, you know, like a conventional snare drum. Uh, I, I, I didn't think of it then. I'm thinking about it after the fact, which is good because yeah, yeah. I would have done that. So the little drum is uh, up on the stand and and I'm playing it. And, and uh, you know, I think it was Schnee, right? That, yeah, uh, Bill Schnee. Schnee, and, Schnee and Katz in the room. They, uh, they didn't say anything to me. They didn't say, hey, Jim, can you turn it, tune it down a little bit? Can you, have you got something else? Guy, can you put a, a blanket on the freaking thing or can you do something? No, they didn't say anything. So I'm going, okay. Yes. I, I was playing in the studios enough by that time where I knew if I can get away with something, fine. If not, you know, because I always wanted a little bit of ring or, or something from the snare drum. I always hated the uh, the flat thing. I hated that. But, yeah. but and, and I shouldn't, it's, it's too bad because... That's the way the Beatles records were made. That's the way uh, I played on so so many of the early big songs that I played on were done with drums like that. You know, I think it's just a personal thing. It's like, you know, do you prefer cherry or do you prefer apple? You know, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so in any case, uh, that's what that little drum was. And, uh, and that little drum is for some reason, I don't know why I did this exactly, but, uh, uh, the uh, Nashville Museum or Hall of Fame, something in Nashville. Yeah, they have. Yeah. And uh, uh, I've loaned it to them. Yeah. You know, beautiful. Okay. And uh, and I loaned them also my uh, my big old uh, twenty two inch Zildjian ride uh, that I used on uh, Bangladesh uh, with Ringo, and uh, and my little 
crash symbol that I used on Josie as well. So I think it's the it's the crash symbol and the and the little uh, Vista Light Ludwig snare. Sure. Wow! From, All right, and the uh, and I threw in the uh, the uh, trash can, the garbage can lid that uh, Fagan had me do the overdub on on Josie in the middle. Okay, so the, that okay, the sixteenth note. Yeah, I think in the middle, trash can that Bob Yeager and John Dents, uh, God rest his soul, a wonderful friend of mine, great drummer, played with Stan Getz and an East Coast drummer, John Dents. Okay. And uh, he he was a really good friend. And so he was at the drum shop one day and he and Jaeger said, uh, they were laughing at me, probably talking about me and laughing and said, well, let's give him this for Christmas. And so they dented out a uh, an old garbage can lid <laughs> and uh, of it. so they had the holes in where the handle was. And then they put, Merry Christmas, Jim, and something else, and crazy stuff. <laughs> and they put ribbons in it. <laughs> so it, it just had just a little bit of a buzz. I didn't, uh, there was, it was a piece of uh, garden scan lid. Anyway. Oh my God. I didn't, you buzz. know, this, that part, Jim, has baffled me for years. I didn't know that. I, I thought it was an overdubbed hi-hat. I, I wondered if, if it was overdubbed or if it was like a delay. It almost sounds like they put a like a digital, some sort of a delay on the... No, the they, beat of this. so that's that's no, you overdubbing. They they used some nice reverb, is what that was. But yeah. but uh, but it, it was uh, <clears throat> it was one one night they uh, uh, I did uh, I did some I, I was doing something for them for Fagan and and Walter and uh, and they said to me, "Do you have uh, what have you got that's odd? Anything?" anything like an odd sound for the for the middle part here and to over the one and i said uh wow i got something in the trunk and i went and i had the the thing so it must have been right around the time when i got it so i brought it in and they loved it obviously it's a garbage can you know yeah. Donald Fick loved it so uh now, that's how now yeah and I, I can hear that in my head now that you say that it's a, yeah, yeah it's it's a great well can i just ask you um during the sure. verse of josie Toward the end of the verse, where 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 Donald sings, uh, "Throw down the the jam till the girls say when," that thing you do you double up on the hi hat and play a sixteenth note? Like, are you playing it? Do you know that part where he goes, or is that an overdub? Oh wait a minute, you you talking about the you're not talking about the fill. Well, there's a there's a time. There's the there's the fill that you do. Yeah. Okay. No, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah talking about the little when the hi-hat uh, goes to 16th yes that was what fagan asked me to do okay. um at at those sections every time i think that right. happens every time i think that's right it does you're right. i recall yeah and also the opening of the hi-hat the yes he, exactly where to do that this is this is a part of the funny part of that story i've told this a hundred times as well um the the chart you know it was typical steely dan i think they they always had charts and so it, it was a two it, it, it might have been a three pager at least a two pager and so i'm looking at it and i'm hearing the song and i got chuck rainey right here i could reach out and touch him he's by my hi-hat mm. and it's chuck rainey yeah you know i'm going I'm just listening to Chuck and I'm here and you know, all these other badass guys playing, you know, the, everybody on that session were the, were the baddest cats. And so, so I'm, I'm playing and I'm, and I'm thinking, Oh yeah. Okay. Well, this, this is cool. This is, this is no big deal. I don't even have to look over there at the paper. I got this. <laughs> and, uh, suddenly Fagan, who's been walking around slowly and, talking to guitar players and people and and I don't know what he's saying but he's he's pointing at things and then it's, so he's telling them you know over here do this you know to whatever you know try the uh, try this chord like this and you know all the things that he's saying and he comes over to me I, I'm I'm not even thinking that he's going to come to me he gets over to me he goes so right here bar 66 open the hi-hat and then do 
open a hi-hat there and there and I'm, oh shit okay so I'm, look i'm gonna have to watch a little bit and uh and and then there was the little part in the middle the drum fill when it comes out of the the spacey bridge yeah that that dun, 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 dun. Yeah. yeah that that little thing uh was uh that i was scared of that because it was uh it was i think it was a seven eight or a five or so i'm, I'm gonna have to go listen to it again you would think i would know this by now <laughs> but uh gary katz told me or somebody told me that gary katz was doing a seminar somewhere some college or something and somebody asked him about the drum fill in Josie. And, and he said, no, I, I think that's, uh, Keltner made that up. You know, Keltner just played that. And when I heard, a, when I heard that, I said, no, man, that was it. That was written out <laughs> note for note. Those little 16 notes were written out like that. That was Fagan, you know? Yeah. I tried to get Gary to, to get me a copy of the, of the drum chart and he said, it's disappeared. Oh man. I would have seen it, you know, hopefully, hopefully one day that'll uh, appear because that was a little funny part, man. And it scared me. I didn't know if it was going to work, but it did. That's how bad it, see that's again, that's who you're playing with. If you're playing with cats that are so great, you've got no place else to go, but up. You no, know, I, I, I agree with that. Now, just, you know, Rick has told a similar, similar story about Peg and having Chuck Rainey right next to him and just and just, you know, leaning on each other, him leaning on Chuck, Chuck leaning on him. And, the you know, and it Man, just, and I mean, Peg, I mean, that's the world yeah. those grooves of all time, you know. Yeah. Ricky and, and uh, sitting right there with with the, they like that position for some reason with with Chuck. Yeah. And, but what's great about it is I wish they had a picture of that. I wish they had a little bit of a, I wouldn't say video, because I hate playing with videos, but but somehow they had a, <clears throat> a way for people to see the setup in that room. Yeah. Everybody was in the room, and it's, it's not a big room. It was a producer's workshop right there on uh, Hollywood Boulevard. It's a small, kind of a smallish room. Mm -hmm. But everybody was in that room, and I don't remember seeing a lot of baffles so you weren't in an iso booth you were you were in the room with everybody yeah man yeah wow that's wow. that's the genius of bill schnee i think yeah and and gary katz you know producing and using his ears and his wisdom you know i mean come on man that's you know you can't go wrong when you're working with with the greatest people yeah that that really comes down to well two but things Jim. but that should be if people could see that, I think there would be more live recording. I think so too. Yeah. That I, I, I didn't realize that. And um, first thing that song is, is lights out one of the greatest drum tracks ever. Every drummer watching this will agree. That's, that's, that to me epitomizes the Jim Keltner magic. Well, look, I, I must say something here at this point. First of all, I appreciate that very, very much, obviously. Great to hear that sentiment. I must tell you, when we listened to the playback on that, Chuck was looking at me, Chuck Randy's looking at me going, he said, the only place that song grooves is in that little spot that you talk about, which is chicka 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 chicka. <laughs> only time that 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 thing grooves, and I and so I was, I said, oh my god, you know, I know what you mean, man. I know what you mean, Jesus. And that was it. And then the next thing I heard was I heard it on the radio. So was it one take? That was going to ask you how many takes it was. It was, you know, I wish I knew that. I remembered. I, there, must, there, there were probably a sizable amount of takes, maybe like, um, I, uh, the, I don't know. I, I couldn't yeah, guess. Okay. It had to be enough takes because, because the, uh, 
we, I, I know we did the that drum fill. I know we had to do that several times for, for people to understand that, like, oh, okay, it's going to jump. It's going to jump in. It's going to be da 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 boom. Yeah. And downbeat, da 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 boom. That's the downbeat. Whereas da 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 that sounds like it'd be an and. No, that's your downbeat. And so I think that had to be sussed out. And those cats, like I said, they're so good. They're ready for it. You know, nobody is scared or anything. I was scared. But when that downbeat hit, I went, woo! Thank <laughs> Wow. And uh, so there was that to contend with a little bit. I know there must have been a couple of takes just involving that. Yeah. Then the other thing was the overall feel. They didn't want the thing that Chuck Rainey was talking about with the groove and, and the way I was feeling it, too, was that it was kind of like stiff. The, the, that's what they wanted. That's what Fagan was. The, the Donald Fagan is a genius. And he, he and, and I don't mean to leave Walter out of it, but I mean, he and Walter loved crazy shit. Yeah. They, the, they wanted, they, and yet they were really disciplined with their music too. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, especially harmonically, they were so advanced, you know, beyond regular old stuff that was being done. So I think they kind of wanted, they liked that. In other words, what they liked about it was what we didn't like at first. It wasn't that we didn't like it. We didn't appreciate it. Now Chuck, you know, is, is, you know he's, he knows now that it's, he knows what I know about it now. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was, they purposely liked that. And it served the song. See, it's, a, it's, not, a, it's not a typical, it's not like a peg. It's not a pig. It's not a, any of those other songs. Uh, you know, it's not the songs, you know, that uh, Bernard played on any of those. This is just, this is that weird one. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what it is. It's, it's so unique. So, yeah. And, and it does groove, Jim. It grooves like. But it does crazy. have a groove. Yeah, you're oh right. I mean, God. yeah, it, I appreciate it now. And I, and I, and it's, it was, a, it was an eye opener for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, sure. I just got to tell you too, you know, again, as a drummer trying to play that song, it's like, it's, it's one of those songs where if you don't, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, to you, I'm stating the obvious because you know this every day of your life as a, as a drummer, you know this, that you play that a little too slow and it drags its ass off. I mean, you could be like one or two <laughs> clicks behind and it Listen, feels right. Right there. You just said it though. You see, you shouldn't play Josie to a click. No, no, I, I and I don't click because it, because you that song it, it's too quirky. It, that song has to have tension. And the other thing is, if you're not playing with some badass guitar players and a and a Chuck Rennie type bass player, yeah, I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. It's not going to work. It has to be. There has to be tension. There has to be tension. For a song like that, there has to be tension for most songs to work. Let's face it. Yeah, there yeah. Tension. If it's just too smooth, man, then you know, you you you, you may like it and maybe wonderful, but you it, it'll be after your nap when you wake up. <laughs> no, I no, I know what you're saying. I mean, it's it's never going to sound the way you guys made it sound. But sometimes we can get in the zone, and and I find that if I play it just a, a hair too fast, it's rushing. It's like you go from right there to way too fast or right there to too slow. Well, are the guitar players playing the same kind of group? Are they playing, are they being faithful to the thing? And well, as, as best, we don't have the instrumentation, you know. Whether you go up or down, they're gonna be responsible. You're a drum, you're, you're an educated drummer, aren't you? I mean, you've had some high school education at least, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. So you know how not to drag and how to rush. So it's 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 your partners, man. You gotta you gotta tell the guitar players, come on now, now get up there and play this groove. Like right here, you can pull back a little bit, but right here, get up on it. In fact, do all of that and then listen to me while I'm playing and, and let's not just be concentrating on ourselves only. Let's see what happens, this noise that we're making together. And that's the way you're going to make that little thing happen. Yeah. 
Yeah. If you're just trying to, you know, that, of course not. That's that's a horrible groove to try to copy. <laughs> I would say. <laughs> and yeah. no, I know it's it's. By the way, Jeremy Stacy is is watching and he says hello. Uh, we got some, uh, talk got about some, groove. Talk about groove. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, Jeremy. Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah, and remember Texas Tim Root from when from the old Simmons days. He's watching Are as you well. Kidding? I'm not kidding. We got the whole world watching here, Jim. Wow, Jim Keltner. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I won't keep you much longer. I know we've been going a while here, and and uh, a couple of quick things. I I just want to say to you that I loved. We talked about you know the John Lennon work that you did. Um, and some of my favorite work was the early Jackson Brown from For Every Man record, the song For Every Man and uh, Redneck Friend, which is just a you know great yeah. country little tune. And, and, uh, yeah. and, and Ready or Not, which was like, these are tunes that my sister turned me on to, who's older. And, and when I was a teenager, she'd play that. And I see your name in the liner notes and Russ Kunkel and Gary Malibur and yeah. all the cats yeah. and... and Russell played on those big hits, you know, Russell, got to give some to my buddy, Russell, man, Russell Kunkel. Yeah, Talk about a good, a good person. Yeah. You never gonna find anybody say anything about Russ Kunkel, except that he is one of the warmest cats they ever met. Yeah. That's a good man, Russ. That's a good man and a, and a yeah. heck of a fine drummer like yourself. Yeah. All right. Well, Jim, I'm I'm gonna you know we've we've gone a long time, and I so appreciate your generosity and and all this time today. Thank you. Yeah, man. No, uh, no problem. Um, so, so what are you gonna do now? Well, you gonna have lunch? I, it's almost four o'clock here for me, so I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna go up and see if my you wife's got- still home. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to keep you that long. No, are you kidding me? I kept you. Or you probably want to have your lunch now. I'm yeah. I'm, but You're I'm, hungry. But I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Um, I just love you to pieces. You're a hero. You're a treasure. You're a treasure to all of us drummers. You are. I mean, thank you. John, thank you. Thank you for those kind words, man. You know, and back at you, you know, uh, uh, otherwise too, you know, you, you're uh you're a well-loved cat in the in the community, in the drumming community. This drumming community of ours is a really special thing, man. It's a special place. And I am very, very happy to have been a part of this all these years. All this, all these years, all these years, uh, to have been a part of a a, a really, really great loving community. We, we've always been really solidly together, all of all of the Germans. I can't think maybe a couple which will name uh, remain nameless, but you know what I mean? Who weren't just completely 100% on each other's side. You know, like we all got each other's back. Uh, I, I, I appreciate that. I love that. Me too. So, no, I, I think we're all blessed. Well, Jim, if you would sit tight for one minute, I'm going to end the, the stream and, uh, and you, you and I can say goodbye in the, in the room here. Okay. But uh, I want to thank everybody for watching. Thank you all so much. Big hand for Jim Keltner. God bless Jim Keltner. I wanted to show you this too. These, these, I, you know, it's like I have this over my drums when I'm practicing, and it just it gives me endless inspiration. Oh man, you know what a day that was, man, up at Ringo's. Yeah, that was, in, yeah, yeah. Rob Shanahan says guys, it. first time in in all those years to to see each other and hug each other. Oh man, yeah, that was. Amazing. I wish I could have been there to see it, but it's it's just I, I have this to to keep it yeah. as a keepsake. So Jim, thank you so much. Big love to you.